quarantine, I was forced to shut the factory for wow. more than three months. Yes. The girls are not ready, you know? You cannot wear something, a t-shirt saying that, that like, period is power. You cannot say that. And now I have become a menstrual advocate, health advocate. The journey was long. There was this roller coaster moment, you know, COVID kicks in. You just can't go in, for instance, you know, openly talk about menstrual, uh, you know, menstruation in some places. It's like considered as a problem. You know, my major concern was, uh, you know, to tackle period poverty for adolescent girls in school. What you know, we took as a business business model is uh, to create a sustainable and locally known, you know, uh, strategies, develop uh, a strategy that is more uh, accustomed to Ethiopian culture, Ethiopian norms, Ethiopian way of business doing, you know. You just mm -hmm. you have to develop your own, you know, an Ethiopian way. And uh, that's what we are following, you know, the business model. We train, we empower them, um, knowing the, the different region, even from... Hello, African Gold Growers. Welcome back to a new episode. Today, we have an amazing guest in the interview section. Today, we have the honor of having with us Tumika Mamu, a social entrepreneur from Ethiopia, a mother, and a truly admirable individual for her dedication and effort in helping others. She began her career in the textile industry, where she identified a need for baby clothing in Ethiopia. However, after hearing terrible stories about what many women in her country had to endure during their periods due to the, to the lack of access to sanitary pads, whether it was due to their uh, scarcity, excessive cost, or because it was a taboo subject in the society, she was deeply moved by this reality that affects over 6 million women in Ethiopia alone. In 2019, she decided to start a Pads, a company that not only manufactures washable sanitary pads, but also provides education and an entire system for women to have access to quality menstrual health with the goal of ending period poverty to the year 2025. Without further ado, let's begin our interview where Mika will share her story, challenges and new projects. Stay until the end to discover the wonderful secret she shares with us to all African entrepreneurs. Don't forget to subscribe like the video and leave a comment. Thank you and let's start. Uh, welcome back African Gold Growers. Welcome to a new episode. We have the honor today to interview to Mikal Mamo. She is an Ethiopian entrepreneur. She is focused on the uh, women health sector. She produces sustainable menstrual pads and her brand is Adipads. She is an entrepreneur in this area since uh, 2019 and well, we have a lot, a lot of questions to hear to listen from his amazing journey. Welcome, Mika. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a uh, pleasure to be invited by your group and we finally make it to have to make this interview as well. Thank you again. <laughs> You're welcome. The first question we have to you, uh, Mikael, I was reading you started in the industry of uh, clothing before you find a gap yeah. in the baby clothes, isn't it? You're right. How was this process? You find a niche in the baby clothes and then you jump to the, to the menstrual health sector. Okay, uh, this is just uh, an interesting question. That's mm -hmm. almost my everyday question uh, question by interviewers like you well apparently uh, my engagement was in the garment in industry mm. specializing in baby apparel such as onesie uh, pajamas diaper locks uh, then comes uh, a switch uh, a turning point was when i noticed the shortage of uh, uh, extreme period poverty in my areas, even nationwide, countrywide. Mm, so I can I can say that that was a, a turning point for me to to shift to the menstrual hygiene and 
the turning point was on a certain specific day mm -hmm. where I happened to visit IDP center in my area. I live in the outskirts of Abu. So there were IDP women and girls uh, who were in short of uh, sanitary kits. They don't even know what to use. Uh, uh, what reasonable, even the disposable and reasonable, what menstrual hygiene management is in short. Uh, so I have seen uh, previous, you know, uh, videos. I just didn't give much detailed attention previously mm. on YouTube and in other news that there are sanitary, reasonable sanitary parts. Mm. So I happened to Google it and get a prototype and designs. Samples of fabric and give us a test, a trial, as a trial pads, you know, as a trial product. And they loved it very much. And that was uh, my moment to start. And now I have become a menstrual advocate, health advocate. The journey was long. There was this roller coaster moment, you know, COVID kicks in shortly after. The Adi, you know, becomes more popular, I can say. While we were on a spotlight, COVID comes and, uh, you know, everything becomes downhill. I was forced to shut the factory for wow. more than three months, yes. You know, have an employee layoff, pay out of pocket. But besides that, you know, uh, I have the gut, you know, in, to go back again. Because it's, I can say... Uh, um, you know, I'm a social enterprise, I'm a social entrepreneur, I run a social enterprise, mm -hmm. so I don't have to give up as an entrepreneur, you know, I have to look, I have to take you to me, you know. Yeah, in this, uh, in this process, well, it's, it's very interesting to listen to you because we always listen to stories about entrepreneurs, but all, as you said, it's always a role caster, and we need to be very aware that will be good times and will be very difficult and challenging time, and we need to be prepared to to make front to them. And uh, as you said, we have a mission as entrepreneurs, or I think our, our business is our mission, you know, the solution we are bringing to the market, and it's very inspiration to listen from people to you. Now... The question that I have, I, and I was um, thinking the other day, how was your process to design your product? Because I see you have different uh, different products you have for um, like more intensive period, like uh, low uh, quantity of period, etc. So yes. how, how was this process to design? How many layers of clothes or fabric do you need to use? What kind of material, etc., etc.? So after I switched to the reasonable sanitary pad manufacturing, you know, my major concern was, uh, you know, to tackle period poverty for adolescent girls in school. I was more aware that there is uh, high menstrual absenteeism mm -hmm. recorded. On average, uh, a girl misses three to five days. So and that's a huge one, you know. It's, she misses more than 50 school days. Mm -hmm. Imagine how she can be competent with her male counterparts, even with her peers. You know, achieving this woman empowerment or girl empowerment or be it education or work is unthinkable without, you know, providing a hygienic menstrual product, you know. Empowering starts uh, from giving uh, a product or anything to them, providing menstrual hygiene product to them. So my main focus was on adolescent girls. Uh, mostly um, government schools that are poorly maintained, uh, no lack of uh, uh, water or uh, disposing uh, places. Uh, poor washing facilities, no adequate soap and, uh, you know, anything related with the menstrual hygiene management. We start, uh, so we start to have an awareness session. We created an awareness session program where with the girls scouts there, uh, uh, with the different uh, 
volunteer groups. Uh, those that are very active in uh, sexual and reproductive health experts. So that was with, uh, with the training. We started with the uh, sanitary parts today. Then we start to diversify another portfolio, you know, for the working moms, uh, for the women in the IDP centers, um, for fistula survivors. So uh, in total, there are five up to six menstrual uh, product line at Adeta. So we have these pair of panties, uh, another pair of panties for disabled women. In, in, oh. We say to the, you know, as a socially conscious enterprise, uh, what, you know, our competitive advantage or what's uniquely identified as um, from other competitors is, we, usually put, you know, the disabled girl or woman in mind, usually. There is, I can say, a uh, few to none products in Ethiopia available. Uh, a tailored one, a customized uh, menstrual hygiene product in Ethiopia. So um, we have a, a, a different product for, you know, wheelchair user, uh, a bed pro a protector for bedridden one, uh, another kit, uh, parent parties for fistula survivors. You know, it's the ongoing, uh, it's the current conflict and ongoing, you know, uh, you know, trauma and uh, you know the war outbreak in Ethiopia. Uh -huh. Of course, a lot of you know fistula survivors is still yet to be discovered again. So, uh, with this in mind, we have uh, around five to six products. We even have maternity pads. You know, through this journey, we have discovered that uh, the scarcity, the period poverty, do not only affect um, students, it also affects, you know, working moms, stay-at-home moms, moms in the IDPs, marginalized women, you know. So we, have to, we happen to be a gap filler. What, what is IDPs? When you say uh, IDP center, what is Displacement center, the IDP people. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Okay. Because of the war outbreak mm -hmm. in the past two years, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of uh, IDP centers are established. Yeah. You know, it still is, sadly. So uh, we even concentrated on such areas, you know, uh, in all region of Ethiopia. Now. When you how how you discover the the business model? I, I mean, uh, as social business model, who was this person okay. that you discovered this uh, social business? Okay, I you know that's a very good question. You know, the business model we concentrated or or we have developed is uh, it's not like it was the buyer and seller or we can we can have uh, you know uh, an agreement or contractual you know business transaction with the international or local NGOs, you know, focusing on the donor side, mm -hmm. want to make they part sustainable, mm -hmm. you know? Of course, we need donors, we need funders, you know, uh, we need partnerships, uh, as uh, you know, it's an early stage. We need all sorts of, you know, uh, financial income, you know, we need to develop such things, but what, you know, we took as a business business model is uh, to create a sustainable and locally known, you know, uh, strategies, develop uh, a strategy that is more uh, accustomed to Ethiopian culture, Ethiopian norms, Ethiopian way of business doing, you know. You just can't go and, for instance, you know, openly talk about menstrual, uh, you know, menstruation in some places. It's like it's considered as a problem. The girls are not ready, you know. You cannot wear something, a T-shirt saying that, that like, paradise power. You cannot say that. You mm -hmm. have to develop your own, you know, an Ethiopian way. And uh, that's what we are following, you know. The business model is we train, we empower them, um, knowing the, the different region. Even from regions to regions, uh, you need a different, you know, way of uh, methodology of, you know, training, for that, we use locals, we use volunteers, mm -hmm. 
locals that are very much, uh, you know, that uh, accustomed to that specific areas. We gather information prior from, you know, uh, uh, giving out or going for a donation. So the business model is um, a, a different way, uh, uh, a local way. We adapt with localization, you know, because at the end of the day, uh, donors will leave you, uh -huh. uh, will end, but what you can build, you know, a self-sufficient way of, uh, you know, creating uh, an Ethiopian model, an Ethiopian w uh, methodology, an Ethiopian um, with anything will be a sustainable one, will be the only reliable um, way we can go. Because we have seen through COVID that, you know, those donors who have been, you know, giving, you know, be it, uh, a loan or money are now on a financial constraint themselves. Uh -huh. They were forced to shut because of the travel ban and anything. Uh -huh. We have seen different So we, we try to come up with our own way, with our own thinking. Uh, of course, we need to go a long way. We are now restructuring our you know, strategic plan for the next, you know, three to five years, you know. Mm. We are almost reworking everything, restructuring ADE again. Because through expansion, mm -hmm. things are becoming, you know, overwhelming. And for, for that, we, have, we are very lucky that volunteers are, you know, coming, you know, to help in any ways, you know. Those business experts, uh, the social entrepreneurs, uh, some NGOs are also coming as a way of, you know, helping in restructuring um, how we can, you know, uh, we can take a roadmap and everything. So let me see if I am understanding. Your business model is first you go to the schools with yes. the local people. You train to the girls about menstrual health in their cultural way You're to right. make empathy. Yes. And then you can sell your product. Yes, usually selling comes, um, uh, still we look for, you know, uh, partnership with mm -hmm. be the local uh, government organization or international government organization. Other than that, we follow our own way, uh, like working with the locals, with the volunteers. Mm. So usually, usually, like I can say, 70% uh, of our, you know, income is through donations. Mm, through partnerships, okay. you know, a certain angel will be interested to, to. Hello. Yes, hi. Uh, you're well. You're back. <laughs> <laughs> I think you on WhatsApp. <laughs> ah, it's, it's it's arriving right now. The message. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the, the network actually is funny because the network in Mexico and Ethiopia is bad, both sides. <laughs> so, don't worry. So, you were telling me uh, your business model now is 70% around uh, donations, so ONGs that support you. Donors will come, they will buy from us, Okay. and there are specific places. Actually, working with donors or, you know, uh, creating partnership with the, be it, uh, the government or international donor is that there are places that are very, very much far away, very remote area. So logistic is a big headache, you know, as a startup company, mm. you cannot be there through so many issues, you know, security is one issue as, as well, you know, there are, you know, sensitive areas now red zone areas previously in the northern part of Ethiopia because of the war outbreak. Mm -hmm. So for such and such reason, we really are a very great school and we need, you know, partners, you know, to for scalability and you know reachability as well. So seventy percent works that way, you know. They reach in very remote areas and the business model that we adopt is working with volunteers where, you know, they can deliver the item in a, to a destination that is very remote even again. Mm -hmm. So they do this freely once we give them the product. We create a matchmaking and they will take 
care of the logistics and you know the supply chain and they give us you know uh, an evidence that the students or the moms received these hygienic kits and the other one is our collaborative work with an amazing initiative uh, i care and jognit ethiopia they are the pioneers uh, they have been in period poverty uh, movement uh, creating so many campaigns and advocacy with the government as well on tax on availability you know on, on so many issues uh, these are uh, our project the hygienic kit for instance the brick kit is a collaborative work with i care and and that's another one and we're very lucky to you know to be able to that's that's really interesting now uh well i i meet your your project because i care i i was following i care in instagram and then you appear in the scene and i started following your project a few years ago so and i think i i think it was during the pandemic actually yeah. because the this reality hit in all africa in general uh very very much now the other question that i'm is coming to my mind now is a huge project you have a big factor you you are employing more than 80 women right how do you found it i mean where the money comes to fund to rise this project i mean you are telling us you're taking support from volunteers but you need infrastructure you need uh you know a warehouse uh, material etc uh, for that, you know, uh, uh, we have a direct selling uh, channel as well. Mm -hmm. Some bidders or um, like exclusive agents mm -hmm. as a business will we'll take the, our sanitary product and, you know, disseminate through all, all over Ethiopia. Through that, we manage to get our source of income. And even as I told you before, with the NGOs, the buying is uh, in huge in bulk because we are in a contractual agreement with them as well. So these are our uh, direct source of income. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, there are individuals or a group of people who want to you know just help mm -hmm. the uh, through us. You know, they will uh, finance the project. Like they might sponsor. Uh, 200 people, 200 girls, 300 girls, you know, even a thousand. And they want us to give to our nearby school or uh, to the schools they previously attended. So we will look for volunteers to that specific area and we'll deliver the items needed. That's our source of income. But for but when you started, you it was the same process? I mean, when you began the project, uh, you started with one machine, with five machines, with uh, how many? How was this the process? The machines that were, were for specific hygienic for the ADE was mm -hmm. uh, uh, around 20 machines. Okay. 20, 20 machines. Uh, I was still parallelly doing the kids' closing line. Uh, Even okay. I still did to finance, to finance it. You know? I didn't totally about it. Uh, getting fabrics and using, you know, scrap fabric from, uh, you know, waste fabric from uh, the apparel will also help me in making the reusable pads as well. Oh. So we did that uh, percentage is like 80-20, you can say. Like 80 to 85 percent is totally uh, for sanitary pad production. Interesting. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's so you still have the project. This is how everything starts because you are already in the industry. So you have the machinery, you have the materials, you have the contractors. That's really interesting. Yes, we go to the door. We, uh, we create usually a networking session, you know, uh, so many corporate social responsibility, you know, so many big corporates are very much interested these days mm -hmm. with our work. So we do uh, collaborative events you know, showcasing our products, you know, introducing to the community or to the uh, sectors interested in 
women empowerment, you know. Nice. So through that, we create this, you know, visibility. Even we try, uh, you know, as much as possible to create a digital presence as well on LinkedIn, you know, on all social medias. That's what you we use. You have a total professional website. I mean, from all the projects that use uh, sustainable sanitary pads for, for women in Africa, your your project is the most formal. I mean, you have the social media very well managed, your website, the campaigns. It's very, very well structured. I mean, this is really impressive. It's time consuming, you know, we have to yeah. go all on things. But uh, I think we are making it and we're still looking you know for you know social media content creators you know on a volunteer base they train us a lot they you know they edit our videos and they do an amazing work with us they love the project you know i, I one thing i created um i learned from the you know for from this journey is that i think ade is also a, a vision shared to people not to me as well mm -hmm. no yeah they're embracing the other concept, you know. They want to help in any means, you know. Those with higher vis uh, you know, visibility on social medias, you know, they campaign for us, they do advocacy using their platform, they share their our pictures, you know, our current movement, you know. Everyone is embracing, even the government. Uh, to, for your surprise today, uh, I was at the U.S. Embassy, uh, there was this women empowerment forum mm -hmm. and of the invited guests majority were more you know all aware about Ade, you know mm -hmm. said, oh, we saw it on social media we saw it on tv we saw it on radio you know nice. you know the, the driving force for us social media is powerful and i mean is when you are watching you are doing a good job and because people start recognizing make a match with your project they right. feel empathy with your project this is this is really powerful congratulations thank you so much <laughs> now the next question to the entrepreneurs which one was your biggest challenges in your journey as entrepreneur uh, i can say setting up a day was a huge challenge you know i have the passion the passion by itself was not adequate you know it's mm -hmm. only i know what to do, the, you know, uh, the roadmap was still unclear, you know, I just go and stumble in some areas, and, you know, it was a trial and error. From production development, from product development, to execution, to selling it out, you know, to showing it to everybody. Um, there was, the road was, you know, not, you know, as smooth as you can see now. And uh, COVID comes, mm -hmm. so everything was, you know, again, you know, I have to restart everything again. Yeah. That was also another, you know, challenging moment uh, for me. Uh, and the concept of instilling the concept of social enterprise or entrepreneur is also uh, another issue, you know. We, uh, uh, we have to have uh, a knowledge of, you know, impacting and profiting at the same time. Mm. You know, so people will expect that, you know, uh, as, uh, are they as an NGO. No, it's different. <laughs> right. These are also another issue that we have to make clear, you know. Of course, we have our own uh, corporate social responsibility where we can, you know, address a group of girls and students. But at the end of the day, in order to create sustainability, we have to make money. Yeah. We have to be profiting. We have to stay afloat to the market. And such things are, you know, uh, were a big challenge for me. And it still is. But now, I mean, through the help of, you know, expertise, uh, getting aids and um, creating long-lasting partnership, I mean, nice. we are. I, I think I'm paving a good way for the for the uh, incoming uh, another one. You know, who will be engaged in the social enterprise sector. Now I have the whole experience. I can say. Yeah, and I think uh, COVID was a very very hard university for all entrepreneurs in general. I You're mean, right. 
who survived to COVID and, and the people who doesn't survive in the project, but they still have this spirit of entrepreneur and they take the learnings, yeah. they, will, they will grow so much because it was very, very hard three years. Now, uh, well, coming to my mind, do you read uh, about social business, the concept of Professor Mohamed Yunus or just watching another enterprises? Uh, I saw Mohamed Yunus through another uh, uh, sanitary pad manufacturer in Kenya. Mm. And then I, I came across of Googling it and, you know, try to read as, uh, about the Yunus Foundation, you know. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, yes, we have a social enterprise network in Ethiopia. It, it's called Ethiopian Social Enterprise. Well, this is really huge because not in many countries exist that, and it's really important. I mean, in this in this channel, we have the interview of with would you are two social business, you know. Uh, the first one was uh, from a Germany uh, lady who was actually working in Ethiopia to produce biogas. And oh. she also will meet Mohamed Yunus by a book and uh, somebody recommended the book, she started reading and she created biogas production. And now oh. I'm finding you literally like a social business. I mean, making a social impact, understanding this, the economical sustainability of the project, etc., etc. So it's it's really interesting. Uh, it's uh, been finding these amazing projects in the in the process. <laughs> now the the other questions in your um, experience and after all this journey you have living that has been not easy at all. What kind of recommendations can you give to the entrepreneurs who are just starting in Africa? What kind of advices? I can say that they need to follow their passion. They need to stick no matter what, you know. Because for sure, uh, if they follow their passion, you know, everything will fall on the right place and it's uh, on the right time, you know. Uh, for instance, uh, those bigger NGOs I considered previously, you know, I used to think that working with them won't be, you know, a thing of, uh, 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 you know, an easy thing. But you know, now we're working with them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, passion can drive, uh, can bring anything. You know, the right people, the right infrastructure, the right means of uh, utilizing things. You know, you can get the expertise. You can get the help, you can get the finance, you can get the funding, you know. Now everything is digital. So I can see that they don't have to give up on their dream. Uh, they have to stick with their plan. They have to have a backup plan as well. You know, it doesn't have to be a pandemic, but, you know, <laughs> other <things> might relapse. <laughs> a pandemic or a war in the middle. <laughs> You're right. So I know it's a roller coaster moment, and uh, that's the beauty of it, I guess. I think you are totally right. I'm totally agree with you. I mean, you need to follow your passion. It's, it's, it's something interesting because in all entrepreneurs we are interviewing, normally yeah. they are saying the same. Stick with your passion. Stick with your passion. Uh, well, this is, this is really powerful. Thank you. And you said, I was reading, your purpose is to eradicate in Ethiopia the menstrual poverty, to call it in some way, uh, to 2000, 2025. Uh, how is your plan to achieve that? Because it's very ambitious, but at the same time, I think you are making a huge impact for the hundreds of hundreds of ladies, of uh, students you are impacting every month. You're right. Uh, you know, it's 72% of uh, adolescent girls in Ethiopia, even women, do not have the means, do not have access. It's a huge number. 22 million is a staggering number to tackle, you know, and I might be, you know, over ambitious, you know, sometimes. Uh, but through a collaborative work, I can say period poverty is achieved. Um, we can alleviate per period poverty, mm -hmm. not as an individual or as one enterprise or one association, but through collaborative work with the government, 
of course, with the initiatives, with the volunteers. It's a collective work. It's an everyday work, in fact. And you are taking leverage. You're right, leveraging everything. Taking, you know, tapping out from every expertise. Now, I can say that, you know, uh, tackling 22 million to one enterprise is, of, of course, unachievable, I can say. But uh, through collect collective work, collaborative work, uh, it's, it's very easy. Period poverty is um, unachievable, you know, uh, agenda. We are working on it. So we are working with policy, you know, uh, advocates with, with lawyers, with the Minister of Health, Minister of Education. There is this national task force now set up, you know, to to tackle this period poverty issue as a, a, a country-wise agenda. Nice, super, super interesting. Will be, that will be a day's success story to be part of this national dialogue, national task force. And I'm also on a ministerial hygiene members. You know, there are around. Uh, uh, 10 to 12 uh, reusable sanitary parts uh, manufacturers. So it's a collective work, I can say. In this uh, area, in this specific sector, we are not competitors, rather we are complementers, I believe. Wow. I like it. I like it so much. I mean, in a market like Africa, the needs in general are so huge that normally we can in a, speci in a specific, when we are bringing strategic solutions like you are doing, uh, I think we are not competitors, but I like your fries. I like it. <laughs> uh, well, the last question is uh, something you want to ask us or uh, something uh, you discover soon that you want to share with the audience. I mean, something new you, uh, you learn it and you want to share with the audience. Thank you. <laughs> so this journey as you know it's not uh, a journey that I will take solely as Ade or as Mikal but as ex uh, explained previously it's a collaborative work it's a, 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 collect a collection of you know ideas uh, people finance logistics everything at once uh, so we'll be having a, a bigger uh, movement now we all have, we always use, you know, um, different advocacy methods, you know, networking with the, the youngsters, with the older people with expertise. Uh, so now we'll be having a bigger back to school campaign and we would like everyone to join our course. We are planning to, you know, to address one million girls as an enterprise. Mm -hmm. We want to keep these girls in their workplace without any shame and embarrassment, especially to, in their academic year. We want them to excel, so we want everybody to join hands in ha hand in hand to this noble cause. That's what I would like to, you know, to use the opportunity to call for, you know, partnership, to call for people, to call for expertise, to call for volunteers. Because we are going to share here in the in the video in the description all the links and all the information she is talking about. Thank you so much. No, you're welcome. <laughs> so well, thank you so much, Mika, by your time. So thank you by sharing all these experiences with us. Um, I think it's very nutritious and very inspirational to listen to people like you that are making a huge impact in Africa. And well, I think our audience will learn a lot. And well, for sure, sure, our audience is principally from Kenya and Uganda, and we are sharing to expand to other countries. But I think yes. it's very inspirational, and many people can join to, to your project also in our social media. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to get a platform. Uh, and we are very happy as as a CEO and as Ade, as myself thank you so much we hope to meet in uh, uh, another success story interview very soon 
Thank yeah. you again. <laughs> Well, uh, we hope uh, soon can do this uh, another interview, but face to face, and no more in your in your factory. No, that's... We love that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, uh, Mika. Well, <laughs>